The following video is a collection of extracts from Andrew Knight's book called The Costs and Benefits of Animal Experiments. Andrew Knight is a practicing vet. In his introduction, Andrew Knight says the purpose of this book is to judge the merits of animal experimentation. Key topics covered are animal costs, human benefits, alternative strategies, and educational animal use and student impacts. Global animal use. Taylor and colleagues estimated that a total of 58.3 million living non-human vertebrates were subjected to fundamental or medically applied biomedical research, toxicity testing or educational use in 179 countries in 2005. This extract is about the greatest animal users. The USA was the greatest user of laboratory animals, using an estimated 17.3 million. However, the exclusion of mice, rats, birds, fish, reptiles and amphibians resulted in an official US total of only 2.8 million. The EU was the only region publishing harmonised statistics on laboratory animal use for its member states. Just over 12 million animals were used in the 27 EU member states in 2008. REACH, which stands for Registration, Evaluation, Authorisation of Chemicals. REACH aims to assess the toxicity of some 30,000 chemicals produced in or imported into the EU in quantities in excess of one tonne annually. It has been estimated that reliance on traditional whole animal testing could require the use of almost 22 million vertebrates. The next three extracts describe the types of laboratory animal use and they're in Chapter 3. The main species used, their origins and types of use are indicated by an examination of the 27 member states of the EU which constitutes the only major world region publishing harmonised statistics. EU statistics are currently published every three years and at the time of writing the most recent statistics describe laboratory animal use in 2008 with the exception of France which provided figures for 2007. Rodents and rabbits jointly made up 82.2% of the total number of animals used. In this group, mice and rats accounted for most of the animals, comprising 59.4% and 17.7% respectively of the overall total. The second largest group, at 9.6% of the total, was made up of poikilotherms, which are cold-blooded organisms, which in this case, and laboratory animal statistics generally, refers to fish, amphibians and reptiles. The third most common animals used were birds, which represented 6.4% of the total. Fourth, the group consisting of horses, donkeys and crossbreeds, and pigs, goats, sheep and cattle, represented only 1.4% of the total. Carnivores made up only 0.3% of the total, and non-human primates only 0.1%. No great apes were used in 2008 or in 2005 and 2002, the preceding reported years. The next two extracts are to do with the categories of use of laboratory animals. One is fundamental biological research, as distinct from those in applied nature, and this equals 38.1%. Two was human and veterinary medicine and dentistry, R&D, applied research, which equaled 22.8%. Number three of categories of use was human medicine and dentistry, production and quality control, and this was 11% of overall numbers. And number four, fourth, was toxicological and other safety evaluation, and this equaled 8.7% of the total of categories of use. Fifth on the categories of use of laboratory animals in EU member states in 2008 was veterinary medicine, production and quality control, which equaled 4%. 
6 was education and training and this equaled 1.7%. Seventh was disease diagnosis and this equaled 1.5%. And eighth was other and this equaled 12%. The next two extracts are about procedural invasiveness. At the time of writing, procedural invasiveness was not directly indicated in EU reports. However, some figures were available for Australia and Canada. Categories of invasiveness of animal procedures in Canada. In category E, the animals experience severe pain. In category D, they experience moderate to severe distress or discomfort. In category C, they experience minor stress or pain of short duration. And in category B, they experience little or no discomfort or distress. Or stress, sorry. This extract is largely my own work as I feel terribly strongly that animals should not be subjected to anything near severe pain. I don't think they should be in laboratories at all, to be honest with you. But anyway, I've put the, the brackets, the, the rectangular type brackets around this, so it's not Andrew Knight's work, but it comes from exactly the pages of his book. Anyway, it says in 2008 there were 2.3 million animal procedures in Canada, of which 6% were categorised as being in Group E i.e. experiencing severe pain. Now a little bit of maths and I've worked out that this means that 138,000 animals experienced severe pain while in Canadian laboratories in 2008. As previously mentioned the EU doesn't publish statistics on the invasiveness of the experiments undertaken on laboratory animals in the EU. This needs to be rectified as I'd like to be able to know or work out how many animals in the EU are experiencing severe pain while being experimented on. So to, reiter to reiterate the EU, ne EU needs to publish these statistics. Anyway, in brackets at the bottom here, I've just put note that I've extrapolated these results from the graph on page 25, figure 3.5, entitled Invasiveness of Canadian Laboratory Animal Use, 1996 to 2008. This extract is about anaesthetic use. At the time of writing, anaesthetic use was not directly indicated in EU reports. OK, that's a boo for the EU then. Or those of Australia and Canada. Boo to Australia and Canada as well then. It was however indicated in the reports of Great Britain. Hooray for Great Britain. And Great Britain is the seventh largest, or I should say, and Great Britain was the seventh largest animal user in 2005. In 2009, 2.4 million British procedures that's 66.7% of the overall total, which is about two-thirds, did not use any form of anaesthesia. General anaesthesia was provided throughout or at the end of terminal procedures in approximately 342,300 cases, which was 9.5% of the overall total in 2009. What worries me about this last paragraph is terminal procedures. That in terminal procedures only 9.5% of the overall total are receiving anaesthetic. Terminal procedures mean that the animals actually die from the experiment. An example of this would be the LD50 test where 50% of the animals die to ascertain a toxicity level. Now if these animals are not receiving any anaesthetic at all and it sounds like they're not there's an awful lot of animals in UK laboratories and, and laboratories worldwide that are experiencing a very large degree of pain and for me this cannot be moral. This extract is entitled Impacts on Laboratory Animals and it's taken from chapter 4. 
It reads, unsurprisingly, the chronic stress experienced by most laboratory animals can result in immunocompromisation and increased susceptibility to a range of pathologies. In addition to creating significant animal welfare and ethical problems, such conditions and their effects on laboratory animals may also distort a wide range of experimental outcomes such as those dependent on accurate determination of physiological, behavioural or cognitive characteristics in animal models. For example, housing and environment. In gene studies, Cudlio and colleagues in 2007, for example, found that aorto defects associated with the absence of a certain gene almost vanished when affected mice were housed in larger, slightly enriched cages. The next 14 or 15 slides are looking at the usefulness of animal models to humans. The first one we're going to look at is stroke and head injury models. At least 10 published systematic reviews have described the poor human clinical utility of animal experimental models of stroke and head injuries. O'Collins and colleagues, 2006, conducted a very large review of 1,026 experimental drugs for acute stroke that had been tested in animal models. They found the effectiveness in animals of 114 drugs chosen for human clinical use was no greater than that of the remaining 912 drugs not chosen for clinical use, thereby demonstrating that the effectiveness in animal models had no measurable effect on whether or not these drugs were selected for human use. Other animal experiments. Of seven systematic reviews on the utility of animal models in other clinical fields identified by my review, uh, that's Andrew Knight's review, in only two cases, he says, and one which was contentious, did the animal models appear to be clearly useful in the development of human clinical interventions, or indeed, he says, substantially consistent with human clinical outcomes? In Andrew Knight's summary of Chapter 5, he writes, The premise that laboratory animal models are reasonably predictive of human outcomes is the basis for their widespread use in safety and efficacy testing of drugs and other clinical interventions. However, systematic reviews of the clinical utility of large numbers of animal experiments selected without bias does not support this assumption. In Chapter 6, Andrew Knight continues to ask whether animal models are useful to humans. This chapter is called Human Toxicological Utility of Animal Models. Carcinogenicity bioassays fail human validation. Despite heavy reliance on rodent carcinogenicity data during the regulation of human exposures, the conventional rodent bioassay has never been formally validated against human data. On the contrary, validation studies have found this bioassay to be lacking in human specificity, and that is the ability to correctly identify human non-carcinogens, resulting in false positive outcomes or even human sensitivity, which is the ability to detect human carcinogens at all. This extract is to do with chemicals and drugs that cause birth defects in babies. Uh, it's called Animal Terrogenicity Testing. And it reads, in 2005, my colleagues and I published an extensive survey examining the human predictivity of animal teratogenicity testing, Bailey et al. 2005. Nearly every putative pterogen tested in more than one species was examined, a total of 1,396 studies. Discordance between species was apparent in just under 30% of these 1,396 reports. We then analysed in greater detail data for 11 groups of universally acknowledged human teratogens that had each been tested in up to 12 laboratory animal species or species groups, namely the mouse, the rat, the rabbit, the hamster, primate, dog, cat, pig, ferret, guinea pig, sheep and cow. 
Among these species, the mean sensitivity for these known human teratogens was only 55.7%. Fully 21.4% of results were equivocal, and false negative outcomes occurred in a disturbing 22.9% of cases. Only around half of these known human teratogens proved to be pterogenetic in more than one primate species. We also found that fewer than 1 in 40 of the substances designated as potential teratogens from animal studies were in fact conclusively linked to human birth defects. We concluded that the poor human productivity of animal-based teratology warrants the sensation of animal testing and that resources should be reallocated to the further development and implementation of quicker, cheaper and more reliable scientifically validated alternatives such as the embryonic stem cell test. Andrew Knight's summary to chapter 6 reads and this is probably just an extract of the summary because I'm only taking extracts even from the summary of his chapters of his book. Anyway, it reads, Because human toxicity data are lacking, the identification and regulation of exposure to potential human toxins has historically and contemporarily relied heavily on animal studies. These are often reasonably sensitive for human toxins. However, poor specificity results in high false positive rates, markedly limiting positive predictivity. The next few slides give the scientific reasons why animal models are limited in their ability to predict human outcomes. It reads, Factors limiting the human utility of animal models, chapter 7, Animal Model Limitations The scientific limitations incurred through modelling humans by animals in fundamental or clinically applied research and toxicity testing are considerable, wide-ranging and increasingly recognised. These may include differences between species and sexes with subsequent effects on toxicokinetics and pharmacokinetics. PK, the study of bodily distribution, particularly ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion, or pharmacodynamics, PD, the study of mechanisms of action and drug effects. Additional frequent limitations include loss of biological variability or predictivity resulting from the use of single strains, young animals, restriction to single sexes, and inadequate group sizes, lack of comorbidities or other human risk factors, stress-related physiological or immunological distortions, and the use of unrealistic doses and exposure durations. Interspecies variations in P450-dependent monooxygenesis, for example, are well established these constitute the major family of xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes, enzymes catalyzing the oxidation, i.e. the metabolism of foreign compounds, such as drugs or toxins. Their major purpose is the generation of non-toxic blood-soluble metabolites suitable for renal, i.e. via the kidneys, or other excretion. Interspecies differences in metabolic pathways, rates and products may decrease efficacy or produce toxicity and are a key cause of high clinical trial failure rates during pharmaceutical development. And that was De Masia et al. 2003. In fact, only 8% of all drugs progressing to human trials after demonstration of safety in animal studies gain FDA licensing approval, and that was PIP in 2008. Chimpanzees are closest models. Systematic reviews indicate that chimpanzees lack utility as experimental models for studying human diseases. On the face of it, this seems counterintuitive given the genetic similarities between chimpanzees and humans. Our two species shared a common ancestor just five to seven million years ago, 
a very short period in phylogenetic terms. A 2005 draft of the chimpanzee genome confirmed it to be 98.77% identical to the mean human genome in terms of base pairs. However, insertions, deletions and consequent misalignment raised the total estimated difference to 4-5%. to While a minority of these genetic differences lie within the structural genes, which are responsible for all protein production other than regulatory factors, most are now known to lie within the regulatory regions of our DNA. By controlling the activities of structural genes, regulatory genes can exert an avalanche effect on hundreds of other genes. Consequently, a small difference may have profound effects. Striking differences have been found in the levels of gene expression between chimpanzees and humans in the brain and liver, for example. Although chimpanzees and humans differ in only 4-5% to of their DNA, this is sufficient to result in a difference of around 80% in protein expression yielding marked phenotypic differences between the species. Other laboratory animal species are much less similar to humans both genetically and phenotypically and are therefore even less likely to accurately model the progression of human diseases or human responses to chemicals and test pharmaceuticals in the great majority of cases. Discordance between rodents and primates. Relevant differences between rats and humans include mean lifespan 2.5 years versus 70 years, food consumption 50 versus 10 grams, basal metabolic rate 109 versus 26, anatomical differences and these include the four stomach, symbols gland, or Symbol's gland, Hadrian gland, Preputial gland, and Clitoral gland, and these only exist in the rat. The stomach pH is different as well, it's 4.5 in rats versus 1.2 in humans, and very significantly DNA excision repair rates are low versus high, so that would be high in humans. This is the summary of chapter 7, what was it, the, the utility of animal models. That was its general title. Anyway, it reads, Many systematic reviews have demonstrated that animal models are not genuinely beneficial in the development of human therapeutic interventions or the assessment of human toxicity. Animals frequently fail to accurately mirror human responses with sufficient accuracy or fidelity. Interspecies differences may exist in absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination pathways or rates, resulting in differing toxico or pharmacokinetics. Differences may also occur in toxico or pharmacodynamics, and all of these may contribute to differences in organ systems affected, and in the nature and magnitude of those effects. Moving on now to another chapter, chapter 8, a different topic, and this part of the book is concerned with non-animal research and testing mythologies, scientific interest in alternatives. In 1981, a Centre for Alternatives to Animal Testing was established at the John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health to support the creation, development, validation and use of alternatives to animals in research, product safety testing and education. In 2004, the British government established a National Centre for the Replacement, Reduction and Refinement of Animals in Research, whose ultimate aim is the replacement of all animal experiments. Similar centres exist in Germany, Austria, the Netherlands and Japan. Between 1998 and 2010, 30 distinct tests or categories of test method that could replace, reduce or refine laboratory animal use had been assessed and declared by the European Centre for the Validation of Alternative Methods, ECFAM, an EC organisation, to be scientifically valid. 24 had achieved regulatory acceptance. 
In 2008, a partnership was announced between the National Institutes of Health, Chemical Genomics Centre of the National Human Genome Research Institute, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the Environmental Protection Agency. The partnership aims to meet the future toxicity testing needs of the EPA and the National Toxicology Programme by implementing recommendations proposed in the NTP's Roadmap for the Future and the report of the National Research Council's Committee on Toxicity Testing and Assessment of Environmental Agents. And this was called Toxicity Testing in the 21st Century, A Vision and a Strategy. These reports propose significantly increased roles for non-animal alternatives. Scientific resistance to alternatives. However, resistance to the use of alternatives remains considerable in some governmental, academic and commercial sectors. Sharing and assessment of existing data. Legislation should be enacted for mandatory disclosure of toxicity data. European authorities have made data sharing mandatory under REACH. Quality control of biological products. Regulatory safety and potency testing for biological products such as vaccine batches has traditionally relied on animal models. Indeed, the quality assurance and production of medicines accounts for around 15% of all regulated EU scientific animal use. Such tests are responsible for a higher proportion of experiments resulting in severe, unrelieved pain and suffering. However, six variants of human immune cell-based assays have been validated in a collaborative international study. Such human in vitro assays can achieve sensitivities and specificities of greater than 90% for human pyrogens. And in contrast to the Limulus horseshoe crab amoebocyte LAL test, may detect non-endotoxic pyrogens derived from gram-positive bacteria or fungi. Sensitivity and consistency may also exceed those of rabbit assays. These assays may also provide insights into mechanisms of pyrogenicity and acute pro-inflammatory reactions in patients. Developmental toxicity assessment using embryonic stem cells. Organisation for Economic Cooperation Development OECD test guidelines for the assessment of developmental toxicities such as embryotoxicity and teratogenicity are costly and time consuming. Two or multi generational studies may consume up to 3,200 animals per substance. Test guidelines 414 prenatal developmental toxicity study. That is the study that will consume up to 3,200 animals per substance. And it is expected that developmental toxicity testing will consume the highest animal numbers in reach. The use and further development of appropriate in vitro systems is therefore a high priority, especially for the animals. These systems may include cell cultures, e.g. embryonic stem cell tests, organ cultures, e.g. micro mass assays, and embryo cultures, e.g. whole embryo cultures. The ability of embryonic stem cells to differentiate into a wide range of potentially vulnerable target tissues maximises their utility. They may be used to test for embryo toxicity in vitro, and to screen for teratogenicity and growth retardation. Human embryonic stem cells are preferable, as resultant assays are relatively simple and reproducible, avoid interspecies differences and may facilitate studies of human development. Considerable standardisation and harmonisation of human embryonic stem cell assays remain necessary, however. Along, that is, with enlargement of the reference database and consolidation of the details of the existing prediction model. This is to ensure their regulatory acceptance. 
This is an extract from Andrew Knight's summary of Chapter 8. It reads, Non-animal models can offer certain important advantages in comparison to animal use, particularly when humans or human tissue are used, such alternatives may generate faster, cheaper results that are more reliably predictive for humans and may yield greater insights into human biochemical processes. The next two slides are just something that I found interesting in chapter 9. After that we're on to chapter 10. Uh, the reduction and refinement of laboratory animal use, uh, that seems to be the title of the chapter, but the subtitle is what I'm interested in, and it reads, Harmonisation of Test Guidelines. The paragraph reads, Regulations for product licensing are issued by national and international regulatory bodies, such as the Commission of the European Communities or in America it's the Food and Drug Administration, and again, still in America, the Environmental Protection Agency seems to be able to also issue product licensing guidelines. Or to be totally accurate, I should say regulations rather than guidelines. Unfortunately, such regulations and underlying test programmes and specifications frequently differ between regulatory bodies. Consequently, companies that wish to market their products in several countries must comply with multiple test requirements, which frequently results in duplicate or additional animal testing. The next five slides are on educational animal use and student impacts. This is very close to Andrew Knight's heart because he had problems qualifying as a vet without injuring or killing animals as part of the course. Anyway, it reads, Veterinarians must be familiar with the clinical signs of disease which might be proposed as a justification for inflicting those diseases on laboratory animals. They must be able to perform a variety of clinical and surgical procedures and be able to function professionally when presented with grievously injured animal patients during surgery and when euthanizing terminally ill or injured patients. Animals are killed and dissected to demonstrate anatomical principles. Living animals or organs taken from them are subjected to invasive experiments in physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology and parasitology laboratories. Veterinary students in most countries learn surgery by practicing surgical procedures on healthy animals. Animals surviving these experiments or procedures are usually killed afterwards by the students. I think Andrew Knight was able to graduate from veterinary school without killing animals or injuring animals as part of his course. Anyway, he says here in this slide, humane teaching methods, and obviously these methods would be able to replace actually injuring animals or killing animals as part of veterinary courses. Anyway, it reads, During the past two decades, there has been a large increase in development and availability of non-harmful teaching methods, such as computer simulations, high-quality videos, ethically sourced cadavers, preserved specimens, models and surgical simulators, and non-invasive demonstration experiments conducted on students who are not put to death afterwards. And finally, supervised clinical experiences. Sadly, there is opposition to these humane teaching methods. This slide reads, Faculty Opposition to Humane Teaching Methods. Despite their potential benefits since at least 1986, it has been my experience, that's the experience of Andrew Knight, and that of veterinary student and faculty colleagues around the world, that many veterinary faculty members remain opposed to the introduction of more humane teaching methods. This is the last slide as regards animals and educational use, and it's about how the students are affected by having to kill animals or deliberately injure them. 
It reads, over time, student participation in harmful animal use appears to contribute to a range of desensitisation related phenomena which adversely impact awareness of animal welfare problems and the desire to take appropriate action to redress them. Such adverse attitudinal impacts have profound potential to decrease the ability of veterinarians to safeguard and promote good welfare for their patients and for animals generally. So that's the end of this review of Andrew Knight's book called The Cost and Benefits of Animal Experiments. Andrew Knight proceeds to conclude his findings and give policy recommendations in the last chapters of the book.